Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, final plenary session of Indoor Air 2016. I'm Glenn Morrison from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. Please take a seat. Okay, thank you. And uh, we start with the first plenary with this afternoon. And I'm happy to introduce Professor Hui Jen Su, but we all call her Jenny. Uh, she's a distinguished professor of the Environmental and Occupational Health Department and the Executive Vice President of National Chengkung University in Taiwan. She was trained in Harvard School of Public Health. She's an associate editor of the INRAE Journal and a fellow of ESIAC. And her research focus is on sustainability, climate change, and health-related issues in the built environment. And that's exactly what she's going to present this afternoon. Jenny, please. As I start, Hugo is going to count how many people come in, because uh, uh, Rich and I have the responsibility of keeping at least a couple hundred through the closing ceremony. But again, I'm humbled by the opportunity to be able to speak here this afternoon. And um, I think the, um, the task is almost impossible, but definitely the privilege and the pleasure is immense. And I want to thank Hugo again for the friendship and opportunity to really come into the indoor air for this uh, session. Um, I'm going to be very brief in the uh, background because um, uh, many of us would be probably more interested in how it related to the built environment. So as a start, um, this is where we are. And the country, as little as it is, it does cover two different uh, geographic, geographic and climate condition, and that includes both the sub uh, sort of subtropic and the uh, tropics. And the university I come from is comprehensive one: engineering, art, design, architecture, um, a sort of, uh, and also medical, a huge medical facility. I think that also highlights the interdisciplinary uh, sort of attributes and the necessity of engaging in this area of sciences. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just simply present a few components that in the wide spectrum of uh, climate factors and simply temperature, precipitation, and air pollution in general. Um, overall, and this is not strange uh, or not unfamiliar to many of us, this is coming out from the most recent report where you can see across the entire global pictures, all the way from the top of Arctic and down to the South Atlantic from the uh, uh, the uh, sort of left-hand side, the North Pacific, go all the way to the Asia. In general, we are looking at a rising trend, regardless of the fact that we might have a sort of a disparity or uh, differences in concluding what is exactly the underlying scientific mechanism that would attribute it to these rise. But in general, it's an acceptable condition. However, let me also remind it that there's a, some local individuality or individual differences that are absolutely profound and critical in how we realize in that we would take our priority and how we would design our individual strategy in combating such a challenge. For instance, over the past 100 years, the overall average rise globally is probably 0.7. In our country, uh, for the past 100 years, it's two times as a global average. And that does present an issue, that does present a specific consideration when we design our study or when we take our component. Now, looking at the precipitation, I think it's clear also, if you look at the overall 100 uh, sort of uh, year average, the pattern is definitely different if you compare only for the past 50 years. Overall, you look at the overall uh, sort of uh, general quantity of precipitation, then you take uh, uh, the uh, calculation for the intensity. It's absolutely clear the intensity is much greater than what we have seen before. 
Now moving ahead again, this is our specific condition. This is the global pattern, and you can see how, what we experience this year in our area is a much steeper one. So the uh, lessons to share and the experiences to share here is that however difficult it is, however uh, sort of a lumbersome and, and time consuming and labor consuming, it's absolutely critical to step by step generate our national or your regional overall spectrum of understanding to your individual statistic. Now, moving ahead, that taking on the extreme side, um, of course, we are aware and we are mindful that the drought or desertification will lead to the increasing events of sandstorm. That definitely presents a different episode in terms of air pollution challenge uh, to the uh, public health concerns. And another extreme would be the flood, which is, again, is not unfamiliar to people who are from this part of the world. And we will share some of uh, those experiences and uh, lessons learned from that particular situation. So what it goes from here is that if you simply take in the previous two factors along, temperature and precipitation, or the changes in humidity and so forth, that does uh, now come to some sciences which would elaborate on the climate change effects uh, associated environmental distribution of contaminants. Therefore, you also come to this global picture um, which is widely available now in the uh, atmospheric area, you see a different patterns in terms of ozone distribution as well as a particular matter distribution. Move ahead, I want to simply very quickly review for you some of the well or better documented evidences in terms of how climate change impact. Now very uh, familiar to many of us is how it does to the ecosystem. But for the interest of this group and in the interest of time, we'll simply focus on the few aspects of human health effects. Uh, many of the literatures, through the efforts of various backgrounds, uh, the scientific efforts, would either go from linking the specific climate event go directly to the health impacts, for, exa uh, for example, respiratory effect, cardiovascular, and so forth. There were also other disciplines working uh, specifically on the sort of mediation mechanism as to on the secondary process that the effects of these climate events would then lead to any uh, specific health impacts of our interests. Le much less to be understood by our community or much less literature available is on the area of how exactly the capability and the level of adaptation would, that would affect our understanding or the relationship we have established between the effects or the exposure and the outcome. And this is pretty much the area that people are focusing on, at least on a regional level, local level, and hopefully on a global level for us to better understand, understand the overall impacts. Now for the public health people, I think in recent years, we have come to use to at least taking this simple, but very, very straightforward and very, very clear approach to understand how we categorize different level of health impacts. For instance, on the direct impacts or the primary impacts, we look at how these climate events will lead to injury or direct mortality. On the secondary or inter, uh, indirect impacts, we look at how the changes of water variability, sanitation, or even the pollution level will again, that will then lead to uh, the uh, specific related health outcomes. Uh, very little or less conclusive is how uh, in the long term some of this mental health or some of these uh, sort of refugee or uh, global economic issues are understood. But we won't have time to go into this today and we'll simply brief for you the uh, few examples on the first uh, two categories. On the direct part, I think it's very, very um, uh, transparent and now become a uh, explicit information to many of us is that and a recent uh, publication which would then go not only on uh, reporting the mortality directly related to the temperature but also taking a first further step to project how the situation or how the risk would likely to be in 2020, 2050, and further ahead. Now this is the direct life loss or the direct mortality. Now in a more sort of a, a local level, this is the risk map we are able to produce for our own country. And I will elaborate or evidence why this is necessary when we formulate 
the individual country strategy in combating these issues. Now, this is uh, simply the risk map for cardiovascular disease um, in the scenario of heat wave, two weeks before, two weeks after. This is for the cold surge, two weeks before and two weeks after. On the left-hand side, cardiovascular disease mortality. On the right-hand side is the respiratory uh, sort of mortality. Now, what we experience also and different from the other parts of the world is that our rural area apparently would have a greater risk rather than uh, some of the uh, inner city or lower income clusters of our city. Um, I'm going to move very quickly also to on the infectious disease. Now, this is also the country uh, risk map we are able to generate after the model was established based on historical data. Now, what we project here is that uh, for every rise of one centigrade in the outdoors, that we are likely to increase the number of counties at risk for dengue fever transmission. Or, and this is the level if uh, the model goes to a sort of two degree increase in average. If you look at also the precipitation, I'd like to mention some of the uh, quick, direct, and very, very significant life loss. Up to this day, this is probably still one of the uh, largest and heaviest flood that have ever recorded, a heaviest precipitation ever recorded in the history. This is a, so much rain that was down to one little area in Taiwan over 48 hours, up to nearly 2,800 millimeters. When it comes to that, it's a very, very significant casualty or life lost. What you see here is the village before, the night before. This is the entire village got wiped out the morning after. And over that, we lost nearly the entire village and the, uh, close to uh, 600 people. Now, this is in terms of the extreme situation and the direct life loss. But again, you can also quantitatively map out the entire region based on historical data, heavy exercise of the statistics, and the model simulation. Now, this is the A mandatory required uh, reported infectious disease in our uh, healthcare system. And we can categorize that in heavy rain, in torrential rain, and the extreme torrential rain, how the risk area is likely to be. And therefore, based on this information, we can uh, not only predicting how we can divert the resources or redispatch the emergency system and the um, medication available, but also maybe start early to have those people either leave the area or have the public health uh, guidance for them to uh, better prepare for the situation. Now, altogether, I think globally, we now have an overall understanding, and to a certain extent, with the uh, dedication of scientific contribution altogether, we are able to even rank them in confidence level to see how temperature, how precipitation, and how maybe two factors together would be related to a different area for different disease, and what would be the risk factor likely to be, and how you can better prepare to that, and how much how many people, how big is the population size is affected. Now, in other instances, uh, let's move it to even for air pollution, based on many of the outdoor data and continuous monitoring. Scientists are now uh, projecting uh, with a change in the level of ozone and maybe to some level uh, particular uh, concentration uh, compared to 1990, looking ahead at 2020 or 2050, how many more people or how much bigger area they are going to be exposed or at the risk of these impact. And this is very much I like to see as a quick summary, then we take an overall sort of uh, index or general variable as a daily to see maybe globally at what level some of these laws can be attributable to climate change. If you look into detail, different regions of the world actually are under a very significantly different level of risk. And this looking from a social justice point of view or from global humanitarian point of view, we have the obligation to work together to better understand the cross-region differences and the effort they really need to put together by international scientists all together. Now, um, uh, uh, you, um, uh, if I could remind you briefly is that 
for most of the information today we see and for most of the evidence that we are uh, presented, much of them or nearly all of them are heavily relied on the outdoor data. In addition, many of these studies uh, uh, are concluded from ecological design. That's basically uh, some uh, sort of uh, disadvantage, some limitation on uh, information coming out uh, from this. And also I think there's very little cases that people can have a full grasp of the total exposure, um, and which then we will very quickly lead into the focus of our presentation later. And again, uh, probably uh, not something that we can uh, completely tackle at this time, but it's fundamentally critical that we bear in mind that the social economic diversity is a, a, a very, very critical factor when we try to have the complete picture as to how environmental hazard is related to the overall public health impact. Move very quickly, I think in this society, we're fully aware across the region around the world, that we basically spend a huge amount of time indoors. Now for this, now we are getting more and more understanding toward how individual attributable risk can be related even the changing portfolio, the changing uh, sort of uh, components of the indoor exposure. And this is very much uh, highlighted in our conference already. But uh, look through the human history. The built in the environment has always been considered as a protective shelter. So what has changed? What kind of new challenges now we have to take into consideration altogether? And there we go. And what we propose is through our study time is that even for few scenario, it probably would be worthwhile to first assess and to have the full portfolio of what's the level of impacts uh, in these individual, uh, in, in the individual specific cases, such as through the extreme uh, water event, does it lead to flooding and dam water damage? Does it sustain in the building? And how quickly does it recover from the event? And for uh, quite a bit of area, uh, quite before the talk, I was speaking to colleagues from Vancouver, Canada. It's exactly the case. We were also worried about what's the um, increasing uh, increases sea level, and it does also lead to the changing system, a, a challenge to our infrastructure system at various parts of the world. And only uh, with the full understanding of the impact level, we can have the full assessment as to how it would impact on the overall populational health in our society. Now, through the week, we'll make sure everyone is here, and if they're missing, I will try to add it up. Um, we, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, listened to and shared the um, information about the history. We had the opportunity to look at the overall, uh, sort of macroscopically, the urban design. We will also be able to uh, appreciate what the individual sort of a detail under uh, underlying uh, uh, mechanism that are facilitating or sustaining our understanding toward the entire system. Now through the keynote lecture, I think there were people also, there were uh, lectures and talks that can uh, offer new information about the biomarker uh, physiological responses under the small thermal stress. There were also information about the uh, sort of uh, um, chemical, uh, the chemistry, indoor chemistry, particle relationships, uh, and so forth. There were wonderful equations uh, proposed by um, prominent scientists to uh, offer another overall or maybe conclusive view of the science in general. But we were also challenged by speaker who uh, reminded us any of the control measure, any of the strategy would also have to take into taking into account the affordability and the feasibility to be sort of implicated in our own region. And this is something I hope we will all take away as we start another line of our study. But in summary, 
there are about 15 sessions that dedicated to air quality throughout these conferences. There were some area also touch upon thermal stress, ventilation, and so forth. Many of them, I think, all together are part of the, uh, have covered the important com components suggested in the National Academy report, where indicated these are probably the five main area that we should take into uh, a sort of further research in our future to see how we can uh, better control or improve our uh, challenged built environment. So with that, um, we have uh, the sciences already support, uh, which for part, uh, gas, uh, part gas pollutant, which for particle, that we begin to have uh, a better understanding or further understanding of the in outdoor relationship. We, but we are also challenging to the changing of modern life. Uh, take one example, at least one third or a quarter of our population now are living with newly introduced uh, sort of compounds into our life for uh, pleasure or for a medication uh, sort of aim or for other purpose. Um, essential oil is definitely one active component and research have supported that with the, uh, these aromatic compounds in our indoor environment. They are likely uh, react and to generate uh, increasing level of fine particle, and especially even at the narrow level. They were also formaldehyde associated with that, which is typical, the secondary uh, hazardous compound, which would then uh, increase the uh, indoor air uh, uh, pollution levels. Now, I move very quickly to another component, which is the moisture part. And a flooded event is all over. And let me share with you, this is this number of people increase over this decades in our area that are likely to be exposed in the flooded event. Compared to 40 or um, 45 years ago, we are at least one times, two times, three times more people in our society that are going to be challenged with these hazards. I want to give you a very quick, quick example as to that present not only the direct effects, but also the sustaining long-term uh, sort of uh, hazard or threat to our indoor uh, air quality. And this is the famous typhoon I already mentioned. Now, uh, we took advantage of this cohort. We actually keep track in this region, not knowing there's going to be a historical typhoon coming to this area. We have kept this cohort, a couple hundred kids in this region for many years. This line is the typical in outdoor ratio of airborne uh, uh, cultural fungi. This is a uh, 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 fungal spore. This is a typical level in outdoor ratio. This is one month after the typhoon, the flooded event. The houses are, have been cleaned. But apparently, there, is a still, there are still a significantly higher indoor-outdoor ratio coming from cultural fungi as well as fungal spore. Now, uh, it's worthwhile to look at how the kids growing up in this situation, how the pregnant mothers that we saw at that particular event were likely to present some kind of sustaining risk to their children um, in the year to come. And this is just one quick example. Now, I, also, I would like to also mention the cases with Legionnaire's disease. Now, it's a typical indoor uh, factor-related disease uh, to the best of our knowledge. Yet, at the same time, we are now having enough or increasing evidence to support that um, uh, analyzing only the outdoor information, you were able to see some sort of uh, connection between the changes in temperature, the changes in precip precipitation will be linked to the increasing risk of Legionnaire's disease dissemination. Uh, we have our own data nationwide over 20 years. As you can see, there's a specific and very clear quantitative by time series analysis and so forth that there's a rise in significant risk for Legionnaire disease um, through this scenario through these cases. Now it highlights that um, even for the typical indoor related, indoor factor related disease, there's an outdoor component or we can take advantage of understanding the portfolio of changing outdoor components to better appreciate and better prepare the event. 
But I think science is important, and um, we appreciate this mechanism proposed in the WHO report. And that's exactly the effort of trying to understand the underlying mechanism, uh, linking all the way from uh, sources of water to the process, to the mechanism, and therefore to the health outcome. We had the opportunity to work with the CG and, and, and friends from uh, Sweden. That, uh, at the particular uh, project, uh, later published in Indoor Air and still very well cited, is um, we, we intend to monitor or we intend to only follow the concentration or the changing level of microbes or uh, indoor microbes. Yet at the same time, taking into consideration total exposure, looking at the process, uh, we propose that it's worthwhile to also collect and fully analyze the pesticides or the SVOC. Um, there are uh, theoretically and uh, plausibly to be in the environment. And important enough, we found out that fungal itself and the uh, SVOC levels are equally important and equally significant in uh, linking to the uh, physician diagnosis, either asthma or the symptoms. Now, through the process that uh, taking line, uh, now is better uh, evidence by the effort of um, uh, Yingping in um, Zhang, Professor Zhang from Tsinghua, that laboratory information also support that the emission uh, of these SVOC and the humidity level of this indoor situation are linked and well linked to the levels of SVOC. Um, and then we uh, supplement that evidence that with our field data at the same time, um, combined with the uh, uh, chamber study. Um, the final category would be thermal stress, um, and it's been very much extensively discussed in this conference. And let's just be reminded that the vulnerable population, the information specifically designated to how the vulnerable population uh, would be further or would be even more threatened or undertaking heavy risk will be a challenge. We have very, very little understanding as to how the low-income family altogether are responding to this challenge and how we can better facilitate their responses or adaptation to that. We do have the report, but again, it requires uh, scientific uh, sort of evidence to either support uh, the further application or to uh, extend their implication. For instance, we now do have the signs about how indoor outdoor temperature differences will be linked or associated with exchange there. We do also know that the occupant's behavior is a in the, is an important and critical factor linking to uh, understanding the particle dynamics. But altogether, is that all sufficient? Do we now have at least some level of conclusive statement or uh, uh, understanding si or sciences about uh, uh, the sort of designated uh, indoor-outdoor relationship to our uh, purpose? Uh, we probably will continue drive for collecting and appreciating the diversity of various building characteristics uh, between different regions uh, around the world. And until then, we can better uh, predict it or couple by the model that are proposed by the administrative uh, scientists, scientists, in terms of what is likely to be in the worst scenario and how it's likely to be if the scenario is to our favor. And this will be a goal for uh, effort. Before I leave that, though, I'd like to share with uh, uh, you a piece of uh, preliminary data that we collect from uh, our zone. Now, this is um, uh, over 50, at least 15 years uh, of effort um, from nearly 750 built environments, including hospital, public facility, recreation, um, uh, classrooms, homes, and so forth. Now, the idea is that we um, assume, we have always assumed, maybe the indoor-outdoor relationship should be steady across uh, uh, a time. However, we do, we have only very little information as to how this relationship might be changing in light of the changing outdoor situation 
uh, outdoor environment, such as the rising temperature, ambient temperature, such as seemingly the rise in outdoor humidity over this uh, 15 years long. Now you see there's a consistent also relationship with slightly rising uh, indoor humidity and indoor temperature. But most strikingly, I think, uh, this is the indoor-outdoor ratio of fungus or cultural fungi. It's clearly identified that probably in the first 15, first part of this 15 years follow up, the situation have improved significantly. But for the past five to eight years, the uh, ratio has been rising, indoor outdoor ratio, with some form of trend. Now, if we map or couple with the flooding event and the level of precipitation, Precipitation intensity in our area is co it correlates very well and is consistent with a, such a pattern. So this definitely um, would uh, promise to design next level of uh, sort of uh, validation. Now, in summary, I think um, scientists at different disciplines will continue to work on what they can contribute to this science altogether. Um, there will be continued effort to see how this outdoor scenario will change and how it will impact on the indoor. For those of us who are from the indoor air sciences area, I think we still have a long way to go to fully construct an exposure profile or exposure pathway and uh, before we can conclude that's the level of exact or direct exposure that leads to the outcome because the, the level of adaptation in individual region, individual country, or even individual community varies significantly. And that will be something uh, to bear in mind from our experiences. Finally, I think who is at risk? Intuitively, we know the poorer, the uh, older, or those who are disadvantaged socioeconomically, but I think quantitatively, um, we need to have more information <clears throat> to justify all these uh, uh, sort of uh, proposition. Now this quantitatively analyze a few important factors uh, that will lead to affecting the overall health um, in light of or under the climatic uh, uh, events, including medical resources, urbanization, susceptible population, and even the aboriginal population. The percent of aboriginal population in individual areas is something also very, very much standing out as an important factor when you try to appreciate the overall outdoor exposure, indoor exposure, auto altogether, and of course, the lack of economic uh, opportunity directly leads to the loss of uh, strength in, uh, in uh, selecting the adaptive strategy. Now, um, I would end by share with you and remind you uh, where we are having the conference today. Asia, uh, in terms of nature disaster, has probably the largest number um, over the uh, past uh, 20 to 30 years. Now, along with that, um, you uh, will see the climate change vulnerability index. This is specifically highlighted or uh, 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 important in, um, in addition to Africa, there comes the Asia, especially Southeast Asia. Now, along with that is the economic loss. Economic loss related to uh, the, uh, these natural disaster. So if you think about it all together, um, you uh, are likely then to be reminded that we also have a fast growing population in this particular zone. Now if we are going to have the increasing uh, sort of heat waves in our region, they will combine with the growing number of populations at risk in this particular region. So I'm all come together, I think uh, we should probably try to tackle or full scheme to understand how these sciences can be all put together. We are used to identifying hazard. We know that we will better characterize the exposure um, and before we uh, come up with the uh, risk level or proposition. But we have probably 
uh, not more than enough, uh, not more than adequate uh, level of understanding of information about how vulnerable individuals are uh, from various sectors, from various ethnic backgrounds, and from various social and economic backgrounds. And this is something uh, we'll be awaiting for us to work hand to hand collectively and to contribute to this overall database. I'd like to share with you this effort by uh, uh, the uh, colleagues from the area of environmental engineers. Now, the idea of uh, analyzing how really resilient or how resi the resilience level of the system they have also proposed to be utilized in assessing uh, these climate-related events. Now, every factor, the loss of every factor is likely to pull away some of or uh, the uh, sort of the uh, existing uh, strength. At the same time, on the other hand, um, the loss of certain power is like to make even other component weaker or less uh, capable to be uh, uh, selecting the uh, adaptive strategy. So therefore, there were a couple studies now, or there were a, a, line, a series of studies now working on either the individual homes, individual uh, sort of intervention plan to see how we can come up with the customized or better design system for a specific area, for a specific population. Uh, studies um, uh, analyzed coming out from New Zealand, from states, and also on macro scale, um, I think there was something also touched upon t uh, this week in uh, one of our plenary talk, and that you can uh, look at the entire uh, city or urban uh, macro responses. In this case, um, this is the uh, increase of our beetle of the building roof surfaces so that it can contribute to uh, uh, lessen the threat or lessen the uh, level of risk. Um, I'd like to end by this uh, shared uh, discussion. Um, a bunch of very, very rich studies have coming out to uh, challenge as to how well that all these researchers and human health researchers can match with the demands of policymakers and detail, quantitatively, qualitatively, that's a certainly a discussion. But I thought if we do step by step and collectively and systematically, maybe there is a way to really participate in the policy level. Share with you is the series of work that we do on the national level, looking at the direct impact, indirect impact, and the social economic research on the national level. So that we, after creating the uh, risk map, we are able to have our prime minister designate a national strategy. In that, we propose how we would do uh, or increase monitoring in indoor in environment, both indoor and outdoors. How we would make the technology available to different sector with subsidy or with the, the government sponsored program. We focus on some form of education to the susceptible people, to the general population. And therefore, you can change and you can write in a different code uh, for the building, different code for the emergency or healthcare system. And that's exactly the process. So then all these uh, guidelines were written into specific strategy for different sector, uh, either uh, to work on different ministry pre and after the disaster for different level, different categories of health impacts. And then you can also take those known established scientists, science to uh, convert it into some sort of public literacy issue. You design those information into primary education, secondary education, and all the way to the general public education. So in a way, um, I think uh, global uh, cost of climate change adaptation is definitely costly. Uh, various statistics ha have come out either by World Bank or um, uh, the um, uh, United Nations program. But having said that, we are also relying on the continued growth of science to suggest how we can better or effectively making a, a sort of a progress in tackling the core issues, whether it's the growth in basic science, whether it's a growth in epidemiology, epidemiology data, or it's a growth in understanding how critical one factor is related to other, would definitely all be helpful in coming out with the final sort of understanding and overall picture. 
So I think um, in summary, what it says here is that there is a lot of need for in, uh, increasing and further research on the uh, sort of mechanism part, the mechanistic sciences, and much and a heavy percentage of the uh, conference lectures through that week have done that. But I think we can also consider whether there is a space, there is a, a sort of increasing uh, emphasis, emphasis in uh, incorporating new analytical tool, analytical sort of methodology to really understand the entire system. Uh, in the different region and different uh, locality, I think uh, we should be mindful that how information and technology can be made available to the needs of different people and different sector of uh, utilization. We also probably can work together to see how effectively those sciences can be linked into pub uh, policy, can eventually make it realized in our system. And you are going to say five minutes. five minutes. Oh, I'll be done in one minute. <laughs> and then um, there's a lot of uh, example, uh, which I think uh, friends from Netherlands and uh, area would, would really appreciate. But the, um, the adaptation technology or the adaptation methodology uh, available one place or visible in one place um, is not likely to be totally or entirely copy and then be transformed to another area. So it really takes the uh, local effort and engagement altogether from bottom up so that you can have the full spectrum of understanding to move that part of the efforts forward. And altogether, there's a social justice. We look all together in a global and international scale. So one way that we can uh, work is probably to have more law being established. Up to this day, I think um, Korean and us are the only country who actually have the IAQ law written into our system. So with that, that comes with resources, that comes with industry, that comes with professional group. Again, that also comes with the public sort of a, continue, a continuous support and appreciation how it can better our uh, human uh, sort of society altogether. And finally, um, I uh, definitely need a delegation and thanks to friends, students, and, and, and all that, and grand funding support over the years. Happened to be a picture taken yesterday from higher up in Hong Kong. Now, as we bid farewell to Indoor Air Conference 2004, we have uh, honored the pioneers. We have recognized the established scientists. But I think most exciting, that it, I think uh, Rich and I had the opportunity to chair one of this apparently smallest, smallest student session, but we, we were all very excited because the time was very limited, so we end up having more time to interact with them. Um, with this new generation, I think um, they will come in with the growth of knowledge. They will come in with a new commitment. And along with that, I think um, we are likely to join hand to hand to make a better human, either build environment or nature altogether for our next generation and the years to come. And I thank you for your patience. Thanks a lot, Jenny, for your comprehensive overview on the impact of global change on the environment and health.